I'm very proud today to introduce to you a wonderful man and a marvelous speaker. Uh, a few years ago, he was sitting where you are right now. And that's something for you to be thinking about. When he graduated, his parents, Enrique and Judy Lincheski, supported him through his pursuit of a new magazine and finally back here to Los Angeles where he became a writer, a really good one. Um, the, he writes original material and he never listens to anything that I have to say. <laughs> hmm. So he came back here and I said, all right, Andrew, it's time for you to get an agent. Let's find a small agency where you can find yourself an agent. Calls me back a week and a half later. Oh, I got an agent. Really? Where? CAA. <laughs> they still represent him. Then he went out to find himself a producing partner. Who did he find? The well-known and 50-year career executive, Rich Frank. He and Rich went on to interview or to pitch, 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 um, at a, a number of different networks. And uh, he ended up at USA Network. Um, Oh, in the meantime, he met his future bride. Where are you, Cher? To the left. To the left, there. <laughs> Who happens to be one of my formers and graduated not only from here with honors, but from the nutrition school at NYU. Congratulations. Back to Royal Paints. He created it. How did he create it? Well, his father, Enrique, was an oral surgeon. His mother, Judy, is a real estate executive. So, a concierge doctor in the Hamptons. That show has been on the air for four years, gaining in popularity with each of them. It's my favorite show on television. And he hired his first intern very shortly after he created the show, Woody Strasser, a communication studies graduate, who is now the writer's assistant and just wrote five episodes of the show for Toyota. They've started their fifth season. Do you know that? <laughs> Last week. Entertainment Tonight. Entertainment Tonight? Weekly. Weekly, sorry. Uh, Entertainment Weekly gave it an A minus and said that they had the best cast on television. And they do. Oh, it's already been picked up for its sixth season. Finally, I get to share a big secret. Andrew is getting ready to shoot his second pilot. He is partnered with uh, Doug Lyman? Yeah, the guy who directed um, Born Identity? Ah. And Swingers, and is the executive producer of Sweets. Together, although Andrew created and is writing the first episode of the show, um, they created a show called American Confidential, and it's shooting its, its pilot for uh, USA. So look for Ed, uh, Andrew and his new partner, Doug Lyman, um, and their new show. Uh, without further ado, allow me to introduce one of my very favorite formers, Andrew Lincheski. I want to thank Marty for the lovely introduction. Some of it was actually true. <laughs> Good morning to the distinguished faculty and alumni, to the graduates of the class of 2013, 
and to all those here to support them. Parents, siblings, close and distant relatives, significant others, BFFs, frenemies, random drunken hookups, <laughs> stalkers, crashers, and people who showed up at the wrong ceremony. <laughs> the commencement for microbiology, immunology, and molecular genetics is actually in the Powell Courtyard. But don't feel badly, people confuse them with comm studies all the time. <laughs> Thank you for having me here today. It's a humbling honor to be standing on this stage in Royce Hall a stage that's been graced by Albert Einstein, John F. Kennedy, and Frank Sinatra. If you listen carefully enough, you can actually hear the stage laughing at me. <laughs> it's doing wonders for my nerves. An experienced public speaker gave me a tip about delivering this speech today. He said, whatever you do, don't talk about money, religion, or politics. I thought that was really good advice. So I'd like to begin with a story about a wealthy and devout Republican. He lived in a beautiful house right along the river. One day the river overflowed and the village began to flood. The man went up to his roof to seek refuge. A neighbor came by in a boat and yelled, get in, wealthy and devout Republican. <laughs> the wealthy and devout Republican, let's just call him Tom, okay? Tom replied, no, God will save me. I'm just waiting for a sign. A few hours later, the water was up to Tom's waist. Another neighbor came by in an even bigger boat. Get in, he said, or you'll drown. No, Tom replied again. I have faith in God. God will save me. I'm just waiting for a sign. A few hours after that, as the sun began to set and the water reached Tom's chin, a helicopter appeared overhead. A ladder dropped down, but Tom waved it away. He yelled towards the sky, God will save me. I'm just waiting for a sign. The next morning, Tom woke up in heaven. He marched over to the administration building, stormed into God's office, <laughs> even though God didn't have office hours that day, and, ta and Tom got right up in God's face. He said, God, WTF. <laughs> My whole life, I was given the same advice over and over. I was told that if I lived righteously and sang your praises, that you would save me. So why didn't you send me a sign? God looked at Tom, bewildered, and replied, send you a sign. I sent you my Navy and my Air Force. What the hell are you doing here, man? <laughs> That's actually a true story. <laughs> What's the point of it? Well, I think there are a few points. Number one, if you're going to live by the river, my friends, invest in some watercraft. <laughs> a speedboat, a dinghy, a boogie board, something. Number two, always be nice to your neighbors, especially if you didn't care for point number one. And number three, good advice can save you or it can kill you. It all depends on how you use it. Tom spent so much time looking for the signs that he ended up missing the boat. Notably, Tom graduated from USC. <laughs> More on that soon, I promise. I'd like to share with you a brief recap of my journey so far. From 15 years ago when I sat where you're sitting now, actually we did it in Kirkhoff, but that's a whole different story, um, to today standing up here, sweating like only a nervous Jewish writer can, <laughs> while trying to look self-confident. Marty talked a little bit about me rejecting the conventional wisdom, and now I'll tell you about a few instances in which I tried to accept it. When I was a sophomore, every smart person I knew told me that if I wanted to make TV for a living, I needed to go to the undergraduate film school. I don't know what the admissions formula is at Melnitz today, but back then, thousands of students applied from around the world, and the school accepted 15 of them. That's right, 15. My chances of getting into the program were only slightly better than our chances at a national football title. <laughs> Sorry, I, I just <laughs> got, I got to tell it like it is. Huge basketball fan, though. I spent most of that year just working on the application. I finally submitted it, and a few weeks later, I got some incredibly good news. I had been rejected. <laughs> I didn't know at the time that it was good news, but not being admitted to that program, which I applied to based on the good advice I had gotten, was the best thing that ever happened to me in college. Well, academically, at least. <laughs> so, <laughs> I applied to comm studies, and I got in, which was very fortunate because the Comm Studies program was where I really began to learn the value and the danger of good advice. 
I was advised to take COM 185, the field studies class, so that I could put an internship on my resume. It doesn't matter where you work, any internship will do, people said. So I got a position on Sunset Beach, a brand new daytime soap opera on NBC. You guys look like you've never heard of it. <laughs> that speaks very highly of you. Now look around. If anyone sitting nearby looks like they're reflecting nostalgically on episodes of Sunset Beach, slowly back away from them and alert the closest community service officer. In a genre where most shows are around for decades, Sunset Beach was canceled before I could even get them to sign my consent form. So my resume was off to the races. Who'd be able to resist hiring a film school reject with three solid weeks of work experience on a failed daytime soap that had been watched religiously by dozens of people? <laughs> but there was a silver lining. In the short time I spent there, I met some really interesting people, people I still know today. And that made me realize that an internship was about far more than how it looks on a resume. So every subsequent quarter I spent at UCLA, I took COM 185. I accumulated a total of eight internships. Marty started to mistake me for one of the pieces of rotting furniture in her humanities hall classroom. <laughs> My parents didn't understand how anyone could work that much without actually getting paid. For parents of a soon-to-be struggling writer, it wound up being excellent preparation. <laughs> but taking COM 185 over and over again had its benefits. Marty became a mentor to me. I continued to meet people who taught me about the industry, people who became part of my professional network, people who became my friends. And most of all, I really dug the pass-fail thing. <laughs> There's nothing more satisfying than bringing home a P. <laughs> when I graduated, it was the spring of 1998, and the internet was exploding to life. Startups and dot-coms were popping up everywhere. It was like nothing the American economy had seen since the Industrial Revolution. The good advice I got was to go work for one of those dot-coms. It, did it didn't matter which one they said, anyone will do. That's how I felt. <laughs> so I got a job at a streaming media company that was started by the maverick founders of one of the very first internet service providers. The dot-com was backed by huge investments from Microsoft, Dell, Ford, Pepsi, and others. Six months later, the company was bankrupt. And those Maverick founders I mentioned, yeah, they were under federal indictment. <laughs> Why? I'm glad you asked. They were accused of using the internet to lure underage children across the country, and then using drugs and guns to coerce them into unsavory acts. And I assure you, the FBI thought way more highly of them than their investors did. At its height, the company was wasting more money than a parent sending their child to USC. Yeah. I told you. By the way, I barely met the founders, almost never saw them, and was in no way a party to or aware of any of the aforementioned felonies. <laughs> Sorry, my lawyer made me put that line in. But like the internships, this job had some upside too. The guy I worked directly for was a highly respected TV executive who the founders had somehow lured to the company without using drugs or guns. He became a mentor to me too, and he told me that if I wanted to end up in charge of TV shows, I needed to write my way there. So he said, go and be a writer. His suggestions, his suggestions sounded suspiciously like more good advice. And at that point, I was feeling a little battered from all the good advice I'd gotten so far in my very short career. But I knew there was at least a kernel of truth in his suggestion, so I embraced it. And my life changed dramatically. I left the company to be a writer, and I spent the next eight years suffering from severe unemployment. The kind of unemployment that makes you afraid to leave your apartment because you're not sure you'll get back in. The kind of unemployment that turns your parents from supportive to concerned. <laughs> the kind of unemployment, just between you and me, that makes you go back to the UCLA dorms and ask the dining halls if they offer an alumni discount. <laughs> True story. Seven and a half years later, after a few odd little writing jobs here and there, I finally started to gain some traction with my scripts. Some people at NBC gave me the good advice to write something topical and relevant. So I wrote a pilot about the U.S.-Mexico border crisis. I showed it to NBC and they said, we love it. It's just way too topical and relevant. <laughs> but they gave me a shot to come back in with something else. Their new advice was to write something dark and paranoid. So I put together a pitch for a conspiracy thriller. You'll never guess what NBC said about it. That's right. We love it, it's just way too dark and paranoid. <laughs> but they invited me back to try yet again. 
So I said to NBC, hey, NBC, I have a crazy idea. Why don't you guys just tell me what to pitch you? And at long last, they got specific. Their final advice was to bring them a medical show with a twist. <laughs> Pause for dramatic effect. <laughs> so a few weeks later, I came back and pitched them an idea about a concierge doctor working in the Hamptons making house calls to the rich and famous. NBC's response, they loved it. But they didn't believe that enough people could get sick during a summer in the Hamptons to generate enough episodes for one season. I was left pretty speechless by that airtight logical argument. <laughs> but more than that, I struggled to understand how NBC could have given me so much bad advice about what to pitch to NBC. So I said to NBC the only appropriate thing I could imagine saying at that moment. I said, NBC, kiss my ass. <laughs> the next day, I pitched that medical show to USA Network and they bought it, which ended up being just as fortuitous for me as getting into comm studies instead of film school. And that more or less brings us to where we are today. Me standing up here and you guys sitting down there wondering what kind of sociopathic commencement speech this is. <laughs> Why is this prematurely graying, deeply bitter young man <laughs> giving us advice about not taking advice? Great question. Here's why. Never in the history of mankind has advice been so prevalent, so available, and so forced down our throats. Everyone has words of wisdom these days and everyone has a platform from which to broadcast these words to the entire world. That makes this a very empowering and very confusing time to be graduating. If this were 15 years ago, you'd go to sleep tonight, having to only ponder the advice you got from me, your family, your professors, and maybe your loudmouth roommate who likes to get condescending after a few boxes of wine. <laughs> but tonight, your mind will be drowning in a hundred encouraging and cautionary voices. You've probably been on YouTube watching the speech that Oprah just gave at Harvard, the one that President Obama gave at Morehouse, the one that Jeff Hoffman, the founder of Priceline.com, gave at Bradley. By the way, Mr. Hoffman was invited to speak at USC, but he didn't know what he could possibly say to a bunch of kids who've never shopped for a bargain in their entire lives. <laughs> You've surely also gotten hundreds or thousands of Facebook posts, tweets, and Instagrams from friends, acquaintances, strangers, and multiple Kardashians <laughs> telling you what they know to be the secret to postgraduate success, sometimes all in 140 characters or less. Very impressive. I couldn't get this thing down to one character under 13,894. <laughs> the point is that's a lot of voices and a lot of advice. So whose voice do you listen to? That's easy. Listen to mine. <laughs> Because my advice, in a nutshell, is this. Today is the day you start listening to yourselves. You guys have spent four years at one of the finest schools on the planet, maybe five years, or even six, <laughs> if your blood alcohol level was higher than your GPA. <laughs> but you know more than you think you know. You know yourself better than anyone else knows you. And anything else you need to know, you'll learn from your experiences, and more importantly, from your mistakes. There is no manual for what you're about to do, no singular right way or singular wrong way to go about it. The advice people will give you is based on the road that they have traveled. But no two of you in this room will travel the same road when you walk out of here today. That's what makes tomorrow so scary and so exciting for every one of you. The journey truly is the destination. If you're lucky, you'll come to a crossroads time and again, and you'll have the luxury of options. When that happens, look for the signs if you believe in them, but far more important, follow your instincts. Make your own decisions. And once you've made them, it's your responsibility to make sure that they become the right decisions through hard work, an open mind, human connection, more hard work, and lots of patience. Having said all that, if your house is flooding and someone offers you a boat, don't be a jackass. Take them up on it. <laughs> That's not advice. It's common sense. Just ask Tom from USC. <laughs> I'd like to dedicate this address to my dad, without whom I wouldn't be here or anywhere. Happy Father's Day to all the proud fathers out there. Go Bruins, welcome to Coach Alford, and congratulations to the class of 2013.